Thank you very much. Everyone can hear me? Not too loud? Okay. There we go. Mostly, it's going to be blank. <laughs> um, when I want you to think about visual representations, there will, be, <laughs> there will be some up there. You may have noticed, I know a lot of you have been reading Suntag's books, and um, she writes about photography, and she never includes photographs in her books. But rather than feel as if she has laid down the law on how one should uh, discuss these things, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to put a few images up there during my talk today. On the subject of illness or suffering and representations, few writers are cited more than Susan Sontag, who wrote two books, as all of you know, I guess, because uh, you've been reading them, Illness as Metaphor and AIDS and its Metaphors. And I'd venture to say, in fact, that there is no metaphor for illness more often quoted than the first lines of illness as metaphor. I'm going to read those, that, those lines to you now. Illness is the night side of life, a more onerous citizenship. Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. Although we all prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. What does this metaphor have to tell us about suffering and its representation? Well, that really depends on whether you choose to take it at face value or whether you choose to look at it more broadly in the context of Sontag's writing about suffering. On the surface, it offers a simple analogy for understanding our relationship to illness. Illness and health, she says, are like two identities that we all possess as human citizens. Our residence in the kingdom of the sick may be temporary and unchosen, and yet we will all reside in this foreign place. It is both foreign and all of ours. Although illness may appear to divide us, therefore, we all have these dual passports in common. Dig a bit deeper into the metaphor, and it's apparent that she implies that sickness is, at least in part, a legal and bureaucratic identity. We're talking about passports, after all. The self is not, according to this metaphor, um, or the, the ill self is not, according to this metaphor, a natural self. It is an onerous and social identity. Above all, however, the metaphor of dual citizenship also holds out the possibility of a return to wellness, a return to home, and that, I think, is reassuring, which is why most often this metaphor is quoted, for its reassuring qualities. For those who choose to consider this metaphor, however, in the context of the entire book, Illness as Metaphor, or in the context of how this work has been received, it must also be recognized as one of the 20th century's most misunderstood metaphors. Immediately, immediately after she writes that paragraph um, about the dual passports, she knocks readers from their firm footing by launching into a polemic about or and against metaphor. She insists that we must speak and write and think about disease without using figurative language or mythical narratives. My point, she declares, is that illness is not a metaphor and that the most truthful way of regarding illness and the healthiest way of being ill is one most purified of, most resistant to metaphoric thinking. Those of you who've read Illness as Metaphor know that her project is to counter popular and literary accounts of illness that perpetuate stigmatizing myths, that diseases are caused by moral failure or signify social disorder. In particular, she's interested in how two diseases, the 19, in tuberculosis in the 19th century and cancer in the 20th century, um, both of which were considered death sentences. She's interested in how they've been encumbered by the trappings of metaphor. 
in literature, um, all, any of you who've taken Victorian fiction know this, uh, tuberculosis was a disease of pure children and recklessly or poetically passionate adults. In Nicholas Nickleby, Dickens offers the quintessential description of TB as a disease of children. Of Nicholas's friend Smike, he writes that the struggle between soul and boy is so gradual, quiet, and solemn, and the result so sure that day by day and grain by grain the moral part wastes away, withers away, so that the spirit grows light and sanguine with its lightning load. You just get this picture of this child sort of growing angel's wings or something. By contrast, cancer through the mid 20th century was thought to be a mark of repression, of insufficient passion and sexual inhibition, of anger held within. So psychoanalyst Wilhelm Reich, who was a bit of a crazy person, but he called it a disease following emotional resignation, a bioenergetic shrinking, a giving up of hope. So, for example, after uh, novelist Norman Mailer stabbed his wife with a penknife in 1960, they were both drunk at a party in New York. It was the era. And he <laughs> defended himself in the press, th who accepted his explanation, it appears, without irony, um, by declaring that so much rage, if repressed, would have caused him to develop cancer. He had to do it, and she didn't press charges. <laughs> um, later, that was in 1960, in 1965, he published a book called The American Dream, and in it, there's a character who explains the etiology of cancer this way. Madness is locked beneath it goes into tissues, is swallowed by cells, the cells go mad. Cancer is their flag. Cancer is the growth of madness denied. Bizarre, huh? Um, through at least the 1970s then, when Sontag wrote Illness as Metaphor, people with cancer often found themselves shunned as if they were infectious or if I remember back to uh, my grandmother, not told that she had cancer because hearing the word cancer would make her give up hope. Um, what interests Sontag are the stories told about cancer, not just by writers and psychoanalysts, but also by medical writers who widely used military metaphors and by journalists who employ the word cancer to signify any invincible predator, not just a disease. The purpose of Sontag's argument in Illness as Metaphor was to warn readers about the dangers of these metaphors, how they distort understanding, which is particularly terrible for the cancer patient in the 1970s who believes the stories told about herself and thinks, therefore, that she is at fault for her own illness, that her emotions are wrong, that she deserves her fate. Thus, Sontag sees her project as an effort quote, not to confer meaning, which is the traditional purpose of literary endeavor, but to deprive something of meaning, to apply that quixotic, highly polemical strategy against interpretation to the real world, to the body. Metaphors, she maintains, distance us from knowledge because we mistake them for reality. They arouse our imaginations in ways that overwhelm reason. It's important to point out, however, that while Sontag is right that metaphors certainly distort, to ask that we speak and write and think about our experience of illness without metaphor or analogy is to ask the impossible. They're fundamental elements of language. Given this, why did Sontag open her book with her own metaphor about illness, the passports to the kingdom of the sick and the well? Well, later in the introduction to the introductory pages to um, AIDS and its metaphors, she called her opening gambit, quote, a brief hectic flourish of metaphor in mock exorcism of the seductiveness of metaphorical thinking. Little did she know that so many would quote it 
out of context and without question or irony. What interests me is not who is right here, the writer who argued against a metaphor or the general reader who embraced the metaphor, but rather the presence of a productive tension between the literary analogy and the argument that has endured. So I've used this opening to the book Illness as Metaphor as an example to introduce a conundrum, a puzzle, about the relationship of suffering to art that will concern Sontag throughout her entire career, an aspect of her work that has largely been overlooked by those who study literature about illness and others in the health humanities that it, who, who use that metaphor that I've gone over so much as an epigram hundreds of times. If you look for art articles uh, on JSTOR, it just keeps coming. It gets retread over and over and over again. Um, in my talk today, I want to talk about Sontag's deep and sustained exploration of the ethics of how audiences regard and respond to representations of other people's pain in work ranging from 1977 to 2003. She first writes about the ethics of reception in On Photography, um, a collection of essays published in 1977, one year before Illness as Metaphor. She returns to the topic in a new way in her novel, The Volcano Lover. I'm gonna guess there's no one in here who's picked up that book. No, you, yeah, you have? Okay, we've got one Suntag fan here, two. Um, published in 1992, um, and uh, her son, David Wright, calls it her best work. He's a writer as well, but most people have never heard of it. Um, you will today. Um, and then again, I'll look at her final book regarding the pain of others, which is also about photography. She returns to her earlier discussion. Over four decades of a career as a public uh, intellectual, she sustained interest in questions about what writing, essays, and narratives, photography, and the visual arts can do to communicate what is real. That was one of her main concerns, to communicate what's real and to alleviate the pain of others. What good, she asks in different ways again and again, is art that arouses sympathy for the suffering of distant others? And how is human misery best and worst represented in art? As I'll show in the remainder of the talk, Suntag describes the challenge of defending the truth of suffering as in part a problem of genre. She adopts and rejects modes of address and representation, the essay, the photograph, and the novel on the basis of whether she thinks they advance the understanding of the real. The critical essay was her genre of choice as she developed her reputation and fame in the 70s and 80s. In these essays and from, uh, that are from her early and middle career, Sontag denounces photographic representations, metaphors, realist novels, and even personal narratives because she believes they conceal true human misery and arouse too easy compassion. Instead, she prefers the essay which she uses to defend reality and reason against sentimentalism. In this period of her career, she sees educating readers, especially about simplistic or false sympathy, as the work of criticism. In the 90s, however, she, she turns away from the abstractions of the essay and what appears to be in a, in a radical reinvention of herself as a writer, she starts to write historical fiction, extolling, extolling the capacity of narrative to educate sympathies and to inspire ethical engagement with the world. For Sontag, the novel, unlike the essay, teaches readers to sympathize by enticing them into pondering the lives of others. Fiction does not, in the end, provide a final answer, a final uh, resolution for Sontag. In Regarding the Pain of Others in 2003, of course, she returns to the critical essay and the topic of photography, still seeking a firm sense of how to respond to the images of human misery that the world and the media continue to supply. 
it appears to me that she's seeking an ideal, she, which sometimes begs the question of whether any art, the metaphor or photograph, the scrupulously researched historical narrative, even the essay or argument, can any art enable us to understand the reality of another person's suffering? So let me return now to Sontag's early career as an essayist. From the beginning, she pushed her readers to engage more deeply, more thoughtfully, more rigorously with art, literature, and the world. That she saw as her, as her job. On photography, um, and in that book, which significantly contains, as I said, no reproductions or images, she argues against any number of forces that she sees as barriers to the real but she focuses in particular on the problems posed by photographs of human suffering. So in that book, she opens it with a, um, an essay called In Plato's Cave, which as you know is about images as well, with a rare autobiographical anecdote. When she was 12, she saw photographs of Nazi, co Nazi concentration camps at Liberation that aroused a storm of feeling and the experience made her realize the ethical complexity of looking at such images. She begins, and I'm gonna quote a, a, a long paragraph here. One's first encounter with the photographic inventory of ultimate horror is a kind of revelation, a prototypically modern revelation, a negative epiphany. For me, it was photographs of Bergen-Belsen and Dachau, which I came across by chance in a bookstore in Santa Monica in July 1945. Nothing I have seen in photographs or real life ever cut me as sharply, deeply, instantaneously. Indeed, it seems possible to divide my life into two parts. Before I saw those photographs, I was 12, and after, and it was years before I understood fully what they were about. What good was served by seeing them? They were only photographs of an event I had scarcely heard of and could do nothing to affect, of suffering I could hardly imagine and could do nothing to relieve. When I looked at those photographs, something broke. Some limit had been reached, and not only that of horror, I felt irrevocably grieved, wounded, but a part of my feelings started to tighten. Something went dead. Something is crying still. It's sort of a little over the top for Sontag and very uncharacteristic for her to, go, to talk, to write that way at this point in her career. This traumatic confrontation with evident, the evidence of human capacity for cruelty marks the end of her childhood, and the impact of those images did not fade with time. So when Sontag was interviewed by Bill Moyers in 2003, when Regarding the Pain of Others was published, he asked her to discuss the most vivid pictures she'd ever seen. And 58 years later, her memory of those photographs from Dachau and Bergen-Belsen were still vivid. She said, I thought when I th saw those pictures, oh God, this is what human beings can do to other human beings. This is reality. The shock of these photographs and the complexity of her own and others' emotional responses to some, such images provides a foundational narrative for me, for Sontag's lifelong intellectual apprehensions and powerful feelings about representing suffering. In On Photography, she describes her own reaction as genuine and appropriate, but she distrusts others' responses. Either one is shattered by these photographs, she writes, or one has not recognized the reality they represent. Her concern about others' responses may not have been aroused, sorry, um, her concern about others' responses may have been aroused by the wide distribution of these images. She was by no means unusual in casually and unexpectedly encountering photographs of the liberations of the camp in 1945. These images appeared in a number of mainstream magazines. 
Unfortunately, because uh, Suntag's published journals begin in 1947, and this occurred in 1945, I cannot say for sure where she saw them, but the most obvious possibility is Life magazine, right? And in 2003, in Regarding the Pain of Others, she wrote that she grew up with Life magazine and had been educated, she wrote, about, by its revelatory pictures of war and art. She also said, if there was one year when the power of photographs to define, not merely record, the most abominable realities, surely it was 1945, with the pictures taken in April and May, early May, at Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, and Dachau, in the first days after the camps were liberated, and those taken by Japanese witnesses in the days following the incineration of the populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, very briefly, I, I dug up what she might have seen in Life magazine. So, Life, you know, portrayed pictures of the everyday and pictures of the, of the celebrities, and then all of a sudden, uh, I think this is May of 45, you had, um, um, who is it, George Roger um, taking some of these photographs, but at least the one in the, f I think the two in the lower um, right-hand side are by Margaret Bork White, okay? Um, this is probably the most famous of Bork White's photographs. She was embedded with troops and was there um, at the liberation, and this one is at Buchenwald. I'm not gonna leave these up there for long. Um, st strangely, I found when I was trying to dig, dig up where she might have seen these, I discovered that she might even have run across them in Vogue magazine, where there is a couple, there were, they ran three stories with photographs by a photographer named Lee Miller, um, who's extraordinary and who, you know, you should look up if you don't, if, if you can. Um, but they were everywhere. So you could open up a Vogue magazine and you could have advertisements for high fashion and cosmetics and then turn the page and have these startlingly terrible photographs um, before you. And that disjunction and the question of how do you have an impact when it's in a popular magazine how do you orient yourself to that experience seems to have been one that changed her as a person and really um, made her explore these experiences for a very long time. Okay. Um, the questions that this raises, is it moral to look at or create representations of human misery? How can one respond ethically to images like that. If a representation inspires compassion that is felt privately and not translated into thought and public action, is it ethical? She argues in On Photography that photographs are often invoked as an aid to understanding and tolerance, but photographs do not explain they acknowledge. In fact, she claims, when people falsely assume that photographs represent the real, then they actually obscure reality. She's concerned that what seeing through photographs really invites is an acquisitive relation to the world that nourishes aesthetic awareness and promotes emotional detachment. Photography, she maintains, has inaugurated a whole new era of inauthenticity in human experience. She's particularly disturbed that photographs can overwhelm viewers emotionally. There's great danger, she warns, that when compassion is exhausted or unmoored from the real, ethical action will be thwarted, if not rendered impossible. Thus, she declares that little can be learned from images and that the knowledge gained through still photographs will always be a kind of sentimentalism, whether cynical or humanist. It will always, she writes, be knowledge at bargain prices. 
a semblance of knowledge, a semblance of wisdom. Sontag thus argues that repeated exposure to images of horror threatens both conscience and the ability to be compassionate. Even those who are attuned to suffering cannot allow themselves to be repeatedly devastated when faced with more and more representations of horror. The ethical content of photographs is so fragile, she explains. At the time of the first photographs of the Nazi camps, there was nothing banal about these images. After 30 years, a saturation point may have been reached. In these last decades, concerned photography has done as much to deaden conscience as to arouse it. So in exposing what photography fails to do, and you couldn't denounce it in sharper terms than what she's just offered, Sontag suggests that what she would like, she suggests by contrast what she would like her essays to do. She clearly wants her work as a writer to give access to what is real, to transmit knowledge, to create the conditions for compassionate understanding and ethical action. And indeed, the project of many of Sontag's best known essays, her early essays, including Illness as Metaphor, is, is to protect reality from the distorting influence of representation. She wants her ideas to affect and change minds and culture. She was ambitious. Um, so at the end of On Photography, she announces, if there can be a better way for the real world to include the one of images, it will require an ecology, not only of real things, but of images as well. She calls for what she says is a conservationist approach to the dissemination of photographs that would prevent the public from becoming inured to the suffering of others. Of course, the rationing of images is not a solution that could ever have been carried out. Indeed, she could not have imagined in 1977 the vast archive of images that would, in a few decades, be instantly available to me and everybody else who has access to the internet. I want to return, just for a moment, to illness as metaphor to emphasize one more point about Sontag's commitment to the essay as her ethical literary form before moving on to the next phase of her career. In Illness as Metaphor, which was published only one year after On Photography, Suntag explored the ethical and persuasive possibilities of the essay, but this time to argue against cultural myths and metaphors of illness. If literature frightens patients away from seeking treatment, then her essay serves as a corrective. In arguing against metaphor, it's important to mention Sontag's essay also makes the case for the superiority of the critical essay over personal narrative. Sontag had a private autobiographical motive for writing illness as metaphor, one that is at least as powerful as her motive for writing on photography, probably more so. But she refuses to tell the story at the time. Sontag was diagnosed with advanced stage four breast cancer in 1975 at age 42. Her prognosis was terrible. Initially, doctors told her she had a 10% chance of surviving. But she decided to have a radical mastectomy against the advice of doctors. She decided to have a radical mastectomy choosing a disfiguring removal of the entire affected breast along with all of the lymph nodes and the chest muscles underneath in hopes of ridding her body of every single cancer cell. She may have been opposed to military metaphors, but I don't know how else to say it. She fought with every weapon medicine had to offer. Why didn't she tell this story in Illness as Metaphor? Well, 10 years later, in AIDS as its metaphors, she explained, I didn't think it would be useful to tell yet one more story in the first person of how someone learned that she, had, she or he had cancer, wept, struggled, was comforted, took courage. A narrative, it seemed to me, would be less useful than an idea. Not until she writes AIDS and its metaphors, that's, and then that's published in 88, so 10 years after Illness as Metaphor came out, does she acknowledge that when she became ill with breast cancer, she was enraged and distracted from her own terror and despair by seeing how much the very reputation of the illness added to the suffering of those who had it. 
Thus, I'd say there's a message in illness as metaphor that's not often acknowledged, that the book contains an implicit argument against the therapeutic ideal of the illness memoir and in favor of the illness essay, in favor of the idea. But something changed after Sontag published AIDS and its Metaphors in 1988. She commits to becoming a writer of big, realist, historical novels. In 1992, she published The Volcano no uh, Lover, and in uh, 2000, a novel called In America, which actually won a National uh, Book Award for fiction. When uh, the critic Jane Akosella asked Sontag about her rediscovery of the novel, she responded, I thought I was a ruminator. I thought I was a student, I thought I was a teacher, and then I discovered that I like to tell stories and make people cry. In an interview with the New York Times, Sontag declared in her typically emphatic ma manner that the essay had become a dead form to her. Now, this turn to fiction obviously marks a change in her understanding of how readers gain access to meaningful experience. After reinventing herself as a novelist, Suntag argues, in fact, that fiction is better suited than the essay for shaping moral understanding. In a 2004 speech, so it's given in the last year of her life, um, called The Truth of Fiction Evokes Our Common Humanity. I can't believe she wrote that title herself, but that's the title that's, that's, that's propped on top of it. She proclaims that the fiction writer is a moral agent who grapples with problems of evil and suffering, asking such questions as, what are we to do when the pain that is endured is the pain of others? Elsewhere, she states that reading should be an education in sympathies. It reminds you that there is more than you, better than you. She says it is the job of serious fiction writers like herself to evoke our common humanity in narratives with which we can identify, even though the lives may be remote from our own. They stimulate our imagination. The stories they tell enlarge and complicate and therefore improve our sympathies. They educate our capacity for moral judgment. In that speech, Suntag announces her intellectual alliance with philosopher Martha Nussbaum. Um, Nussbaum uses the term compassion more typically than sympathy, but she similarly maintains that compassion constitutes a complex sentiment that links emotion, imagination, cognition, and action, and that can be learned or perhaps deepened by both tragic drama and realist novels. Although the philosopher recognizes that modern moral theories have treated compassion as non-rational, she argues that the correct perception of a practical situation requires emotional as well as intellectual activity, and that the emotions have a valuable informational role to play within the ethical life, within, sorry, yeah, the ethical life as forms of recognition. Thus she makes the case for the human importance of a fine-tuned responsiveness to complex particular cases and of a willingness to see them as particular and irreducible to general rules. She also maintains that narratives with complex structures allow readers to learn this manner of responsiveness. Compassion, in other words, is what she calls a narrative emotion. Sontag's historical fiction puts Nussbaum theory into, into practice, using realist na narrative to create conditions for attunement with the pain of others in The Volcano Lover, which was both a critical success and a bestseller, despite the fact that none of us, two of us, know it, okay? Um, Sontag takes historical fixture, uh, pic figures, rather, who have been ridiculed or celebrated by history and by creating conditions for a sympathy that attends to historical and political and cultural context complicates readers' responses to them. The novel also unfolds as an examination of suffering and pain and their uh, representation in both the 18th century and the present moment. She's writing in the present moment. She's got a contemporary frame to the book, but mostly she's writing about the 18th century. The novel tells the story 
a well-known story of a scandalous love triangle. Can you believe Sontag? Right? Scandalous love triangle of Sir William Hamilton, a British envoy to the court of Naples in the 18th century, Emma Hamilton, who was first his mistress and later his wife, and Lord Nelson, uh, the British naval hero during the Napoleonic Wars. Now, the true part of this story, when Nelson arrived in Naples to recover from injuries after winning the Battle of the Nile, he lived with the Hamiltons, he started an affair with Emma. This was scandalous enough, but even more scandalous was that Sir William approved of the arrangement and the threesome lived together for the rest of the envoy's life, even after they moved back to England. The backdrop for this romance is natural and political turmoil. Vesuvius, the roiling volcano, always threatens to erupt, and po the political unrest in the wake of the French Revolution imperils the monarchy. At first, Suntag's portraits of Sir William and Emma Hamilton, um, who are known in the novel as the Cavaliere and the Cavaliere's wife, demonstrate far more sympathy than has generally been granted them by history. Their history, they've become jokes. Um, you can find old punch cartoons of, um, about them that do not depict either one of them in a good light. Um, but she depicts them as passionate esthetes, caught up in politics not because of moral commitment, but because they're members of the upper class and they're allied with the monarchy. They're, they're naive about the workings of power. They're naive about the suffering um, that the monarchy causes. Still, instead of portraying the envoy as a foolish, willing cuckold, as history often has, she emphasizes his passion for, and skill for collecting Greek and Roman vases and art of all kinds, paintings, sculpture, books, antiquities. He's also drawn to the volcano Vesuvius and its uncontrollable energy, which as an 18th century rationalist, he wants to tame through reason transforming it into measurements and figures and tables and collecting fragments of rock. He's a disengaged obsessive who focuses on details, ignoring that the world around him is both literally and figuratively about to explode. For Sontag, Emma is more than just one of history's fallen women. She renders her as a socially and emotionally attuned artist the creator of a form of performance art called Attitudes. At parties, she would pose in tableaus um, depicting scenes from um, mythology and classical history, like the scenes that were on the vases that her husband collected. Um, and each pose captured in the words of a visiting poet named Goethe, um, a significant moment that is most humane, most typical, most affecting. Sontag also renders Nelson, who's called the hero in the novel, more complicated than legend has allowed. She admires his courage and his willingness to endure suffering, but he is, she assails him for his brutal suppression of the short-lived Napoleonic Republic and for the torture and execution of intellectuals who were the Republic's leaders, which is probably why Sontag was so attracted to that, this history. This, when Nelson turns against the Republicans, even after a treaty is signed that allows for their passage into exile, Sir William and Emma reveal the weakness of their political characters. They do nothing to oppose him. At this point, Sontag turns her attention to the political consequences of the egocentrism and self-indulgence that accompanies the trio's sensual and aesthetic passions. While she early earlier rescued the Hamiltons from notoriety, she ultimately condemns them. Sontag, Sir William, Emma, and Nelson are not noble or tragic in the end. They are doomed because of their particular choices, active and passive, in relation to the politics of their place and time. Deep understanding of these characters, she shows the readers, does not preclude ethical judgment. So yeah, you can sympathize with them to fully understand them, and you can still judge them. Suntag's novel, like the Cavalieri's home, is crammed with evidence of her own interests and obsessions, among them her familiar concern with the relationship between the aesthetic and the political. Can art contribute to a just society? What can art, her art, say about suffering? 
She offers answers to these questions in the final section of the novel, where the narrator with whom she has identified all along meditates on the evolving ways that suffering has been depicted in art and understood in culture. Contemplating the stoic ways that many of the Republicans face their executions in, in Naples, um, the narrator states, even the most horrifying stories can be told in a way that does not make us despair. She continues, because an image can show only a moment, a painter or sculptor must choose the moment, and this gets back to Emma's tableaus, the moment that presents what the viewer most needs to know and feel about the subject. But what does the viewer need to know and feel? To answer this question within the context of the 18th century, the narrator considers this sculpture. Um, the death of, of Lawakoan and his sons, and what she wants you to see there is that it is, an, it is a significant moment before the suffering becomes unbearable, where the figures can still seem beautiful and noble. Okay, another example that she offers is the paint is um, the flaying of Marcius, which I can't look at for too long, and nor can she. So I'm just going to go back to this one. Um, in the Cavaliere's era, she states the significant moment for the depiction of an intolerable situation was before the horror had reached its apex, when we can still find something edifying in the spectacle. Perhaps, the narrator continues, what lies behind this curious theory of the significant moment and its prejudice in favor of moments that are not too upsetting is a new anxiety about how to react to or represent pain or deep injustice, a fear during this revolutionary moment of minding too much, of unappeasable feelings, feelings that would cause an irreparable rupture of protest with the established order. So this kind of a representation contains feelings. The narrator contrasts this 18th century taste for art that showed people's ability to maintain decorum and composure even in monumental suffering she contrasts it to modern sensibilities. Writing about the contemporary moment, she says, we admire in the name of truthfulness an art that exhibits the maximum amount of trauma, violence, and indignity. For us, the significant moment is the one that disturbs us the most. And then she brings the novel to a close in a manner that's supposed clearly intended to disturb. She narrates Nelson's suppression of the Napoleonic Republic. She depicts torture and hangings and beheadings. And in a review of the novel, A.S. Byatt commented that Sontag's conclusions makes readers feel the traumas experienced by others. She sees all her people through their deaths, clinically and passionately, and makes us imagine what we would rather not imagine. Because Sontag began to identify strongly as a novelist in the 1990s, it's a bit of a surprise then that she made this big statement, created this epic you know, portrait of, of what suffering, how to depict suffering in art. And then she returns for her last book to regarding the pain of others, to, to the essay. And she also returns to the subject of photography and specifically photographs of war. Now, this is 2003, so one inspiration for this book must have been um, the terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center in the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001, which is 18 months before the book was published. The photographs and videos of 9-11, many taken by amateurs, appeared in every possible media outlet in newspapers and magazines, of course, but also in extraordinary quantities on the internet. And I would bet those of you who are undergraduates probably were, what, like first grade, second grade, kindergarten, what, in there? Fourth grade, okay. So, but do you remember seeing the images accidentally? 
On purpose? On purpose? Okay, so, I mean, it's interesting. Did your parents choose to say, okay, you're going to watch this, or did you watch it on your own? Anyway, but, but this is like that moment for Suntag, right? That seeing of something that is going to change how she looks at the world. And so Suntag, at this moment, is taken again to say, I have to come back to this topic. I have to think about this again. Her re-examination of the ethics of representation indicates that after 25 years, she has not yet succeeded in resolving her struggle with photography's power to foreclose access to the real. In this book, she's again concerned with the ethics of looking from a distance at representations of suffering, worried particularly about looking that doesn't affect action or even learning. She wants to make sense of the disconnect between the reality of war, which at least, very least New Yorkers have experienced at this moment in time, even if the rest of the country was looking at it from a distance, and, or, and Washington saw it close up as well, and, the, and photographs of war. So, to teach her reader, Sontag provides close readings of the false reality depicted by famous photographs of war, so many of which were staged and fabricated in some way. She discusses one familiar image after another, explaining its origin, its construction, its reception. She doesn't include representations, uh, sorry, reproductions of the photographs and drawings in this book either. Um, it, for those of you who've read them, she, all she might have had to do is to mention them and they might have been familiar, but I'm just gonna go through a few of them for you. So she mentions um, that in the Crimea, uh, Roger Fenton's, I'm, this is, I've got the wrong one here. This is Felice Beato's 1858 image of the ruined um, Sikandarbag Palace after the British slaughter of 2,000 Indians. But that image was reconstructed three or four months after the event. This is, um, Roger Fenton's crime, uh, images from the Crimean War. This is the photograph that's famous. If you can see, there are cannonballs scattered all over the road. This is the first image he took. Hmm. Yes, it does appear that he moved the cannonballs. Okay, but the first image is the one that's famous. This one you probably know from Matthew Brady's team at Gettysburg, um, this one is, uh, what is it called? Uh, something about the, sharp, the sharpshooter. I can't remember the name of it exactly, but they famously moved the Confederate soldiers and posed them with their faces turned to face the photographer so that their faces showed up in the images. Um, and apparently there are all kinds of problems here, like the gun is the wrong kind of gun, and I, I don't know the details of it, but that's another one. Um, that's staged. And even this one, it was a recreation in the afternoon of the morning, the battle that took place in the morning, the flag, at, uh, raising the flag at Iwo Jima. They used a larger flag the second time, um, and it looks a lot more graceful. Um, so today's war photographs, um, we get them immediately. Soldiers themselves are posting them, right? And sending them around the world instantly and immediately with little chance of, of, uh, um, of altering them sometimes, although they get altered before they get to us. Um, but they continue to fulfill dual purposes. And the dual purposes she wanted to emphasize in regarding the pain of others, that they both document and transform. And that any photograph documents and transforms an event. And the tension between these purposes contributes to the uneasy ethics of regarding the suffering that they depict. So that seems like she's revisiting on photography. So what has changed? Well, she no longer blames photography and the profusion of photographs for habituating us to the suffering of others. She doesn't argue against photography. And in fact, she ridicules her earlier call for an ecology of images. She believes that our collective failure to comprehend the pain of others is due to several factors. The scale of suffering that photographs now enable us to see, the skepticism 
in which we are inculcated and the passivity that images of suffering and skepticism together promote. Images of suffering, she says, cannot be more than an invitation to pay attention, to reflect, to learn, to examine the rationalizations for mass suffering offered by established powers. Sontag also argues that sympathy for people affected by war is diminished by distance as well as by the relative inexperience of Westerners, particularly Americans, with life in war zones. Americans may feel sympathetic when they see images from Iraq or Egypt or Somalia. In her view, however, the imaginary proxim proximity to the suffering inflicted on others that is granted by images suggests a link between faraway sufferers and their privileged viewer that is simply untrue. That that is yet one more mystification of our real relations to power. So at this point, she circles back to the dilemma that she posed years ago about the photographs taken in the concentration camps. The photographs may engender an emotional response, but alone they cannot teach us about the complex intersecting global and local structures that create the conditions for suffering and they cannot be relied upon to, gen to generate ethical action on their own in the world. As a literary scholar, however, I want to note another difference, a significant one between on photography and regarding the pain of others, which is how Sontag writes after having spent more than a decade focusing on fiction. As Sontag draws regarding the pain of others to a close, the book becomes a defense of the ethical work of narrative. She's writing an essay defending the ethical work of narrative. She maintains that narrative, unlike photography, is an antidote to the allure of war. Quote, harrowing photographs are not much help if the task is to understand. Narratives make us understand. 25 years earlier, she rejected narrative as a means of addressing the problem of illness. In, in illness as metaphor, she chose to write an essay rather than a memoir because she believed a narrative would be less useful than an idea. In 2003, Sontag now believes that stories govern our thinking. More than photographs, narratives require us to sustain attention to stand back, to slow down, to reflect, and ideally to see the subject in a new way. Moving back and forth between the voice of the didactic critic, the essayist, and that of a storyteller, Sontag actually uses a lot of narrative in regarding the pain of others. You might have to go back to it if you don't remember it. And she uses it with particular skill in the opening and closing sections of the book. Sontag, the essayist, provides or presents information and argument. Sontag, the novelist, stages scenes that involve the reader in the ethical problem of representing human suffering. In the final pages of her book, Sontag tells the anti-war story that she believes is conveyed by a contemporary war photograph, a very unusual one. This is Jeff Wall's um, Cibachrome Transparency. It, it, it's displayed in a, in a huge light box, basically. Um, the, the, it's called, the image is called Dead Troops Talk, a vision after an ambush of a Red Army patrol near Mokor, Afghanistan, winter 1986. It was, um, First, it was made in 1992, same year as the publication of Volcano Lover. A reproduction of this um, work in her book could not have been done, could not have done it justice, so, and there isn't one. Wall's photograph is seven and a half feet high and more than 13 feet wide and depicts the staged scene. It's staged, it's a fiction of a ruined Afghan hillside in the aftermath of a bottle, a uh, battle, not a bottle. Um, the artist's task, Sontag says, is the imagining of war's horror. 
which Wall accomplishes by posing actors as Russian soldiers scattered across a desolate hillside, bloody, wounded, and missing limbs. From their injuries, it appears that these men may be, must be dead, and perhaps they are, but they laugh and joke with one another. Sontag concludes by offering her own interpretive narrative about Wall's image. She recounts what she thinks must be a typical experience of viewing dead troops talk. The viewer is, Sontag concludes, engulfed by his accusatory image and thus imagines that the, so the soldiers might turn and talk to us. But no, no one is looking out of the picture. And she continues drawing her book to a close. These dead are supremely uninterested in the living, in those who took their lives, in witnesses, and in us. Why should they seek our gaze? What would they have to say to us? We, this we, is everyone who has never experienced anything like what they went through. Don't understand. We don't get it. We truly can't imagine what it was like. We can't imagine how dreadful, how terrifying war is, and how normal it becomes. Can't understand, can't imagine. That's what every soldier and every journalist and aid worker and independent observer who has put in time under fire and had the luck to elude the death that struck down others nearby stubbornly feels. And they are right. This ending echoes so much of what Sontag has written previously about representation, reality, pain, sympathy, but with differences both personal and formal. I'm gonna talk about this in bring this to a close. When she disclosed in the early pages of In Plato's Cave that her life was split in two by photographs that revealed the human capacity for cruelty, she recognized that she was an outsider who felt too much but could do too little. I actually want to take a, I want to pause for a second. That image is important, right? She was talking about how they, they, didn't, they don't care about us. Contrast that to that image, right? The looking at each other, the not, we don't understand. These, there's a different kind of accusation going on there and it's really kind of interesting to sort of see, see the difference between them. I'm gonna skip ahead. I didn't plan to do that. Given Sontag's new commitment to narrative, her conclusion that audiences can't understand and can't imagine may seem paradoxical. Oh, I, I've skipped something. I'm gonna go back, sorry. Um, when she, in the early pages of In Plato's Cave, she said that her life was split in two um, because she realized the human capacity for cruelty. She recognized that she was an outsider. Between that moment in her life and when she writes this book, she has actually been in three different war zones. She visited North Vietnam. She visited, she was, uh, visited uh, and was present at the, during the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And she went to Sarajevo when it was under siege for many months in 1993. So when she, at 12, she looked at the photographs of the World War II prisoners and she was overwhelmed by grief and confusion. Now she's confident that her understanding and response to the reality of war and pain is not facile. She does not know precisely the experience depicted by Wall, which is a fiction, but she knows enough. She is one of those who is put in time under fire and had the luck to elude death. And she believes, therefore, that she is right, that she can understand this. So she tells us a story to teach us that we, who haven't had those experiences, we can't understand we can't imagine. Narratives, it's paradoxical. Narratives, she says, can make us understand, but now she maintains that neither images nor narratives about war can reach audiences who have not experienced the pain of war directly. If experience defines the basis of understanding, and most of her readers have not experienced war directly, then writing can only inspire a negative epiphany. You remember that phrase? 
she used it when she was writing about seeing those images of the Holocaust. She can only make readers grasp what they don't understand. It appears that the projects of Suntag the narrator and Suntag the essayist remain in tension. The, the narrator pulls at our sympathies, the essayist tells us that our feelings are facile, the narrator uses fiction to educate our sympathies, the essayist insists that knowledge of real war only comes with actual experience. So we are returned as readers to that split opening to illness as metaphor where the story of the kingdom of the sick and the well is followed by a denunciation of metaphor. It would be fair, I think, for you to just now be so frustrated with Suntag that you just wanted to throw the book down, books down, all of them. After reading so much of Suntag's work, though, I'm inclined to see her writing, to see what she's doing here as performative. One way to read the conclusion is as an effort to generate a particular kind of experience. And for the reader who's willing to accept Suntag's narrative of the interpretation of Wall's photograph, she recreates her own foundational experience of standing in a bookstore and looking at human, images of human suffering that she did not want to see, but that seared her mind so that she could never not see them. At that moment, she could not understand. And now she's putting you in that position. In an interview about The Volcano Lover, Sontag said that she wanted her writing, her essays and her fiction, to say to readers, be serious, be passionate, wake up. And in this conclusion, her performance, I think, integrates her work as an essayist and a narrator. She challenges readers to pay attention to the pain of the others by telling them a story. And that story helps them to understand how difficult it is to know that pain. Creating literary performances in which she encourages her audience to regard the pain of others thoughtfully was part of, life, of Sontag's lifetime project. I offer this account of her work to complicate how it is remembered and used, especially when writers quote her tale of the kingdoms of the sick and the well as if its meaning were self-explanatory. Her various proclamations about how to regard the pain of others may or may not be entirely convincing, but consistently she has tried to teach her readers that regarding the suffering of others requires deep engagement and respect for its complexities. It requires more than surface gestures. So earlier I quoted her assertion that images can be no more than an invitation to pay attention, to reflect, to learn, to examine the rational, rationalizations for mass suffering offered by established powers. The same is true for her work, which in contrast to photographs makes that invitation explicit. That's what photographs can't do. Taken as a whole then, Sontag's work reminds us that paying attention to the suffering of others directly or through art or literature is a practice that must be learned and relearned, a practice that always takes effort and a practice that rewards seriousness. Thank you.